the truth Hear the sound of the wind Let the roar of heaven begin Welcome to church today. It is so good to be gathering together, to be connecting together for church today. How good was it to start with that song as well? A huge thank you to our band for leading us in that. If it is your first time connecting to Freedom Church, an especially warm welcome to you. Thank you for coming along and connecting today. My name is Chris. And I'm Naomi, and we meet across the globe in homes, in venues, and online. And if this is your first time, or if you would like to get in touch, please do, we would love to hear from you. Absolutely, you can drop us a message into the chat box, you can send us an email, or speak to a member of our team in the venue that you're in as well. And don't forget to follow us on social media. There's so much happening across our global family. We would love for you to stay connected. Absolutely. And here in the UK, as we step into October, we are celebrating and marking Black History Month. And this is a fantastic opportunity for each of us to learn more about Black History. Black History Month is an incredible opportunity to learn more about the cultures and the contribution of black communities around the world. And this is something that matters a lot to us as a church, but it's also something that's important to Naomi and I. We had the privilege of moving and living in Uganda and East Africa for some years of our lives. 
and also of moving and living in South Africa as well. And one of the things that we quickly realized as to white British individuals living in East Africa and South Africa was our relative ignorance of the history of black communities around the world and the incredible contributions that have been made by black communities um, from the fight against slavery to see freedom from slavery to the fight against colonial rule um, to see freedom and liberty for nations around the world to black communities, people laying down their lives on theatres of war and theatres of war all around the world over um, the past century or more. The contribution of the black community is absolutely huge and has often happened against the backdrop of the most horrendous racism. And that's why it's important for us to engage with Black History Month because this contribution is so often forgotten and it's so often overlooked. And Black History Month is an opportunity for us to change that. We get to celebrate um, black heroes like Mary Prince who was born into slavery in Bermuda. And Mary was traded um, as a slave five times in her life before she found herself in London, where eventually she was granted freedom. And more than anything, Mary wanted to return to Antigua to be with her husband and family. But that wasn't possible for Mary because a return to Antigua would involve a return to slavery because her freedom was not recognized in colonies at that time. And so Mary gave her life to the fight against the slave trade, to the fight for the abolition of the slave trade. Her story, her example was used uh, in Parliament to press for change. And she's thought to be the first black a woman who was born into slavery, whose story was captured. And as she shared um, the horrors and the traumas and the abuses that she suffered at the hands of slave traders, her story brought fuel to the fight against the slave trade in Britain. And in 1833, she got to witness the passing of an act in the UK's parliament that saw slavery abolished uh, right away across the British empire. And this was a huge thing in her time. I would love to show you a picture of Mary but sadly, no picture of Mary exists. In fact, in the UK's National Portrait Gallery, it said that there are four pictures in total of all of the black abolitionists and black anti-slave campaigners, just four pictures in that whole gallery. And yet there are 32 of just one white abolitionist. And this tells us something about why Black History Month is so important because the contribution, the cultures, the, 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 the fight that was um, made by the black community is so often undervalued, under, under considered and underrepresented as well. And that's why it's important for us to engage in Black History Month. And so we want to encourage you to do that throughout the month of October. Let's learn more. You can read articles in the press. You can click through and read links that will be shared on social media. We're going to be talking about it in some of our locations. And also streaming services are sharing movies that you can watch that help you to learn more about Black History Month. Here in Freedom we teach in series and we're in our final week of our testing rooms and hasn't it been a powerful it series? Been if brilliant. you've missed any, head on over to our YouTube channel to catch up. Absolutely, the testing room series has been all about the different tests and challenges that we can find ourselves in in life and how we can journey them well and exit the test through growth. But before we head into worship and before we have our message today, we're going to watch a creative that our team have put together and it's all about how testing and challenge and pressure can be used by God to create something beautiful, strong and resilient within us. I am a diamond, but I haven't always been this way. I'm a diamond, but I used to be dirt. A simple, single element sat content in the earth. I was merely made up of my circumstances, average routine of boring, ordinary normality. I wasn't changing, but then my environment did, and it began to change me. There was great heat and pressure, the powerful pushing upon me, pressure and patience, the wait and the waiting, and the wondering if the strain would truly prosper me. I thought to myself, can any good really come of this, where it seems like there's only pain? Oh, this is so hard. It could break me, or it could make me. So I chose to be transformed, not crushed, built, and not broken. And only then did I begin to see my full potential. It forced me to dream and imagine and make opportunities as I navigated a new design. I'm made of the same thing, yet in these conditions, I am made into something that looks vastly different. Now there is no one stronger than me. I am made pure in the pressure, 
more beautiful in the heat. Now I add colour to light as it shines and is shared through me. At the end, I'm something that adds more value to this world. You can be a diamond. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin
Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful
welcome you to this series, The Testing Rooms. Wherever you're joining us from, I know God wants to speak to you today. So we're in this last part, and it's gone very quickly. There were so many tests that we could cover, and uh, it was very hard to decide which. I feel like there might be sort of like part two next year. But uh, today, we're going to be looking at something that I think every person will relate to. And it's called the waiting room test. <laughs> the waiting room. How many of us have been in a place where it's like, I've waited long enough. I'm sure I'm talking to some people today, right now, that you're like in a waiting room for maybe God to move, for some breakthrough, for an answer to prayer, for something to shift in your life. And I, guys, I've got to put my hands up. I'm not very good at the waiting room. I want to just, this is what I've learned through the testing room of waiting. Please avoid making time contracts with God. Please avoid, this gets us into trouble so often. We get disappointed with God. Why? Because we gave him a time scale. But when you, go, when you get to that point and nothing happens, it is amazing how discouragement sets in. Because somehow we unconsciously, we don't always do it like, you know, vocally, but unconsciously we say, actually, this is, I, I made a contract with God here and I feel like you're not coming through. How many of us have prayed time and time again for something, for a breakthrough? Maybe for some healing, maybe for a situation. And we've prayed maybe over some years. And we've reached a point where we step back and say, do you know what? I'm not praying anymore. There are some of us that have given up praying for a promise because the time scale didn't fit with us. And I've just got a terrible feeling that God, when you make a contract with him, he knows exactly what you're thinking and he will take you beyond the time he gave you just to test you. So, <laughs> so there's a time of testing and a testing of time. Very different. And we have to understand this. I've, I've shared before, and I've shared it in the Firestarter book, uh, about our story, about Heather and I planting church and building church in a small town uh, for 18 years. And after those 18 years, and we poured everything, we poured, some, in some way we'd say we poured in our best years of our life. After 18 years, God turns around, very clearly speaks to me and says, okay, okay, Gary, rehearsal is over. Now it's time to start. And you could have knocked me down because I'm there thinking, no, I started, Lord, 18 years ago. I start, even give me a break, like a year, I may have like warmed up a little bit, but 18 years rehearsal is the longest time anyone has ever done. And he was saying to me, that was just rehearsal. Now we can get started. It was then that we stepped into becoming freedom. So those 18 years for me were just a time. <laughs> On my time scale, I thought I'd started. And then God says, no, you're just getting started. All of this was rehearsal time. And yet I hear all the time of people who give a certain period of time. It's like, oh, I've been praying for three months now. <laughs> I haven't seen an answer. Come on, guys. As human beings, we're impatient with God. We want him to fix things. We, we're almost spoiled in our nature. I've asked, why, why aren't I seeing the answer? And yet all the time he's building something deep and profound, profound into our lives. So I want us to understand this, that we often ask the questions because we made a time contract. In Psalm 105, verse 17 to 19, this is really unusual because I want to use Joseph as an example, right? The waiting room, Joseph, multicolored coat, Joseph, we're all on the same page here. Joseph, I mean, we read about him in Genesis, but interesting that David talks about him here in the Psalms. I don't know if you noticed this. He just refers to him, Psalm 105, verse 17 to 19. He says, he sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. There's a testing in the time. See, God has spoken to Joseph about He gave him a dream, didn't he? As a young man, gave him a dream. But when he gave him the dream, it didn't all work out the way he thought. He probably had a time scale thinking, God, I'm ready for this. By the age of, I don't know, 20, I think, you know, give me a bit of time. I think I'm sort of going to be ready for this. But what happens, it seems to go backwards. And you've got almost God's word, which is the dream, right? That's the dream. It's almost held in suspension. 
And as it's held in suspension, it's got to come into reality. God has spoken words over your lives. Some of you have prophetic words, and you have words that are calling that have been spoken over your life, and they're in suspension. And the longer you walk with Jesus, the more you realize that it's one thing hearing his word, it's one thing walking into that word. It's one thing hearing that word, another thing being prepared for the word. You know, when God called us all those years back, we're going to go and we're going to plant church in this town, we're going to see life change. We saw some life change. But God was talking about the years to come. And his word was suspended. Many of the things he said were suspended. And it was up to us to, to sort of walk in it, to grab hold of them and bring them into earth. Yeah, we get disappointed because it always feels like it's too far away from our reach. And, you know, I, I, I just think, you know, I'm not one of those people that's good at waiting. You're going to wait. You're going to find you're going to wait because God's going to do something in you. And this is what his word says. He says, until the time his word came to pass. So there's a time set. For, for us, it was 18 years. That was the, it was the time was set. We had to keep working towards in the waiting room towards those 18 years. It was like the time of his word. It came to pass and the word of the Lord was there to test. So if God has spoken something over your life and you haven't seen that come into fulfillment yet, his word is there to test your heart in the waiting room. So the first truth that I want to share with you that I've learned in the waiting room is the waiting room purifies your heart. It has this potential to purify your heart. We want to move on, but the waiting room has this incredible capacity to sort of get to the nitty gritty of your heart, your motivations. Are you serving a vision or are you serving him? Was one of the big things in 18 years, God had to drill down with me. He says, yeah, I know you're called. I called you. But are you ready to serve me or are you serving the vision within you? And God started saying, we're going to drill down. We're going to purify this. God refines us through the test of waiting. You wonder what your waiting is about? He's refining something in your heart. Something within your character. Joseph, 13 years of waiting. Moses, 40 years of waiting. <laughs> David, 15 years of waiting. He's anointed king, sees like Goliath defeated. You think, I'm on a roll. Let's go with the momentum. <laughs> 15 years later, he's crowned king. The gap between the word that's suspended to the crown that's put on your head. <sighs> Someone needs to hear this today. Some of you heard the word and it's like it's always been out of reach, but God is saying, no, it's there. It's suspended. It's almost suspended right now in your future destiny. But you've got to move through the waiting room well. You've got to understand the waiting room is to purify your heart. And maybe if you're ignoring it, that will only get longer. Because you can't get to the crown until you submit to the waiting room and the purity that comes through the refining of the fire. See, God refers to his people and he says, you know what, I want, to make, I want to make your heart like gold, the purity of gold. And gold is very, very rarely found in its pure essence. It's normally always mixed with an alloy, whether it's iron or some other metal. And what happens is when you find gold, you obviously put it through the heat. And when you put it through the heat, what happens? Um, gold is heavy, so it's, it remains at the bottom, and all the rubbish of the alloys comes to the top. Now, if you have a lot of alloy and a lot of other metals within gold, do you know what happens with gold? It's brittle. It's not flexible. Think about how God is saying this to us. He's saying, I want to put you through the fire so that what he wants within your heart is to be more pliable. Oh, so it's, there's something of softness in it where we've got hardened hearts and he's saying, no, I'm going to take you through. If we're struggling with the hardened heart, he's going to put you through the fire of waiting to purify your heart in the waiting so that you can come and deal with some things because he wants to bring that purity through who you are. And the funny thing as well is when you get some of these metals mixed with gold, it also 
it's more corrosive. Because there's something that is not pure, that is reacting, that is corrosive and allergic. See, this is what happens with sin. It gets into our life and the Holy Spirit causes a reaction. Right now, you see, even now, he is saying, come on, there's some things in your life. That's what he wants to do in the waiting room. He puts the fire on in there and it's like, come on, we're bubbling away there. Don't start blaming that sister so-and-so. Don't start blaming what went on in your past. Don't start looking at the reasons outside saying, purify my heart, Lord. See, this is what David is saying. He said, purify me. What do you think is happening? Joseph in the prison for 13 years, he's in this furnace he's in this place purify me lord maybe that pride i had when i stood up between my brothers and said hey this is what's going to happen everyone <laughs> oh didn't notice the waiting room was about to approach it looks like a prison but it's really a furnace of refinement and this is where god takes us this is where he wants to see us become more pliable in his hands, pure of heart, our motives, our intentions. 1 John 3, verse 3. And everyone who has this hope, this expectancy of what is to come, set on him, purifies himself just as he is pure. So he's saying, if you grab hold of that expectation of what is to come, see, it's the waiting, that's what you. You don't need hope if it's already there. There's something about hoping for what is to come. That hope about what is to come. Get yourself set on him because he is purifying. He's purifying you through the weight. Number two. The waiting room cultivates the fruit of the spirit. We are so big on wanting to exercise and know the gifts of the spirit. And yet I've come to realize that the more you focus on the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts will just flow in abundance. But if you flow in the gifts of the Spirit without the fruit of the Spirit, you'll find corruption disease sets in. <laughs> and when I talk about cultivating the fruit of the Spirit... You've got to let the, work, the dirt do its work. What I mean by that is there are things, bad things that happen in our lives. Sometimes the waiting is through tragedy, loss, difficulty, challenges that come into our life. And you can say, do you know what? Right now, there is a lot of fertilizer in my life. It's pretty smelly. The poo has hit my life, right? And from that, you think this is so terrible. But God has this amazing way of saying, do you know what? Just let the dirt do its work. Because in those places is where he grows the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> he grows them in places where there is a contest for you to either be impatient and take things into your own hands. Or grow the fruit of patience. To either become angry at God or to find self-control and trust. These will be game changers to grab the suspended word that God has for you. He wants to grow it. Got to let it do its work. There's something about the fallow ground. Again, this is for someone right now. You've maybe had some time, whether it's been a year, you've been waiting two years. And again, it's all relative. Six months for someone in a terrible situation can be like a lifetime. Okay? But whatever that time is, it feels like a fallow ground is when land is set aside and nothing has really grown on it. But it needs a few years sometimes, if there's been a lot of work and a lot of things gone on, for it to almost recover. There's something redemptive and powerful in the fallow ground. And maybe right now you're just thinking, hey, I don't feel as fruitful as I was. I don't feel like where I've got to. I'm just in this place right now. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. The waiting room is this incredible place to grow the fruits of the Spirit. And that fallow ground that's been set aside is the place where you can start to see amazing growth. Oh. You think that the doing is the growth, but actually the growth is in the waiting. This prepares you, you see, for what is to come. There is healing that comes in this place. Do you know one of the greatest superpowers that you can have is self-awareness? And some of us really need it more than others. 
You know, there are times where uh, through the journey I've been on, I don't know, several years down the road, I've suddenly got like a light bulb moment and thought, why didn't someone point that out to me that I always behave like this? I always react like this. And that sort of ability to be able to sort of look at situations and the journey I've been on to evaluate it and actually say, God, teach me something here. Show me where I'm going wrong. Because it is amazing how a blind spot comes into our life and we can't see what we're always doing. You know, I... I've been around people that sort of, they, they make a poor decision and it has a big impact. A year later, they're sort of out of recovery. They're, they're in this place of like, right, let's go ahead. And do you know what they go and do? They go and do the same decision the next year after they've been restored and recovered and God stepped in. And then again, people, perhaps people get alongside them and bring them through to a better place. Another year later, they do the same thing. And there is this cycle of behavior where they're not really looking and saying, how can I learn? If I keep doing the same things, making decisions with accountability, <laughs> if I make decisions without asking anyone for advice, if I don't even look and say, what am I doing wrong all of the time that keeps producing the same result? If, I, if, I'm, if I'm not learning from that, I will keep on repeat on repeat. And God wants to break that cycle. <laughs> And so even in the waiting room, it's time to reflect. I think the waiting room has this incredible way of just reflecting and say, how can I change things? Okay, this has now happened. I normally would react like this, but hey, hey, I need to step back now. Maybe I need to get some advice from someone I trust. Okay, I'm going to deal with things differently. We're going to change that cycle and the waiting room has a chance to grow the fruits of the spirit but it means that we can come in and check what we need to prune in our life. And the Bible talks all about this, you know, the vine and, you know, all of us, we, God intends for us to be fruitful. And that fruitfulness, it requires a pruning. Yeah? Amen? But some of us aren't pruning, we're just letting things grow that shouldn't be growing in our life. Some of the things in our life are just like, they're just off. And, and I've learned that through my limited knowledge of gardening, is if you just let things grow and you want some fruit, you, it will diminish the, the, the sort of capacity of the whole thing. If you just let it, the vines just run without trimming. I just felt like God was saying some of us are just have disregard for some things in our life that are draining our life. It's uncontained. And God is saying it's time to come in. And this word, even right now, in the waiting room is a time of coming and pruning. And saying, let's cut that back. Oof, it's a bit painful. But do you know what? Greater growth, greater fruit is coming. You've got to understand Jesus talks about what this looks like. He talks about it. Hebrews 6 verse 12. We do not want you to become lazy. See, when we disregard those things that are growing in our life, that are on repeat, that there's just no regard to take care, it's almost just let what happen happens. We're lazy. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promised. Faith and patience. Where do you think those are? Faith is something that has grown. Patience is, 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 that is a fruit, ever a fruit. And this patience is not sitting back and just saying, I'm just going to, I'm just going to wait till something changes. Faith and patience is combined nature of expectation for change, but the patience to see it over the line. That is a fantastic scripture. Okay, so on, on to principle three. The waiting room demands self-leadership. And it, I don't care whether you think you're a leader or not, you need to lead your own life. No one can lead your life better than you. No one can make decisions and evaluate where things are going wrong and make decisions to change, to recognize where there is weakness and begin to bring strength. Only like this, it's called self-leadership. The danger in the waiting room, the biggest danger you will face is procrastination, which means I'll sit here till something changes. The more you wait, the more you can disengage. Maybe again, I, I know I'm speaking to so many people right now, that there is something about, well, just been praying into this. I got a bit tired of praying. I got a bit tired of pushing. I got, I got a bit tired of looking out for is the cloud coming. So I'm just going to sit down and have a rest. In fact, some people around me have said, you know, it's just good to rest. 
Well, that's a good reason, isn't it? Let's just sit down and just rest. But the trouble is with this resting under the pomegranate tree <laughs> is an impasse of saying, I won't take movement. I won't, I won't come in expectation. I'm just going to sit back. And it is a discharge of responsibility. Huge difference. And this, this is a dangerous place. And again, I would say to every single person in Freedom Church that is waiting for their future partner, you've got to really watch that you don't end up just sitting back and procrastinating. But you go on daily to become all that you need to be. The person you need to become for who is coming. And I've some people seen some people just wait, thinking I'll sort myself out once they arrive. Guys, don't do it. Become before, become in the waiting room, become, get ready, grow the fruit, grow and be ready. Don't procrastinate. Don't let it all go and hang out. Do something. Do something. It's so true. We, we spiritually, we can so often be waiting and we just get fed up and we sit back into lethargy. And it's a dangerous place because it's very hard to get up once you sit down. The posture of faith and patience is waiting. Posture of waiting, movement, waiting, change my perspective, waiting, <laughs> feeding my soul, waiting. I've got to wait, I've got to get those around me, Pro uh, provoke me and poke me. I've got to, <laughs> don't, don't you settle, don't you sell. Some, some of you got settled and you're a long way from God right now. In fact, you're so distant from him because you got yourself in a place of just waiting where you gave up. If you're here listening to this message, and God is saying, yeah, I brought you here, because it's not over. I've called you here to say, it's time to get up out of your slumber. It's time to get out of that sleepy state. The words are suspended. They're suspended. The words aren't over. The promises aren't denied. They're only delayed. And he's moving. He's speaking to you today. Genesis 39, verse 23. This is about Joseph here. It says, The warden of the jail, so he's in jail for 12, 13 years. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. So he's in prison. What's he doing? He's leading. Self-leadership? <laughs> here it is. He's in jail, and he would have every reason to have self-pity. I'm forgotten. Rejected by my family, he's got all the reasons to say, do you know what, I'm just going to give up and sit here and rot in jail. Instead, he's leading inside the prison. Because anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph, and he gave him success in whatever he did. There was a favor on Joseph in such a way that whatever was given to him, the, the, the guy whose job it really was of looking after all the prisoners said, Joseph, down to you. You're doing a great job. He's a prisoner. But he's decided, I will not procrastinate and see this time as wasted. The time in the waiting room is not a waste. The enemy will say it's a waste. The enemy will say, the only time it's a waste is when we keep going and making the same decisions. <laughs> and, we, and we're back in the waiting room because of our own decisions. But I know God's weight in room is not wasted. He's growing. He's purifying. He's saying, come on, where's the self-leadership? If you can't lead through this, how are you going to lead when you're in front of a nation? These are the tests for what he was going to do in his destiny. The words that were suspended for an appointed time that tested his heart. So we're, we're around here to... Uh, Number four, the waiting room reveals the level of your trust. This is probably a huge one that I, I want it to land really well with us all right now, because this is what it's all about. Will you trust God? Will you think about when you're in the waiting room? God, are you hearing me? <laughs> God, I'm not hearing you. God, have you forgotten me? <laughs> God, will you come through for me? God, why has it gone backwards instead of forwards? I'm in the waiting room. Another year? Have I got what it takes? It's all going to come down to this level of trust. How many no's will you take before you exit the waiting room and say, I've had enough? 
You have a choice to leave the waiting room. How many no's will it be before you take control? Because we love taking control. When we can't get the answers from God, we play God. We end up sort of stepping in saying, right, I've had enough of waiting. I'm going to manipulate the answer myself. How many times have I done that, people? How many times has it not been a good thing and God has said, yeah, you didn't wait, did you? Do you think your answer was better? People aren't listening. God, I'm going to make this happen. And then God says, you should have waited. How many years do you wait before you take control? Does resist taking things into your own hands? Oh, it doesn't pay off. Here in Genesis 40, verse 14, he's in prison. And we know that he ends up seeing these two guys that work. It's the, the baker and the wine taster. And he, he sees them and they have dreams. And he interprets the dreams for them. And they get taken before Pharaoh. And he's here in verse 14. But when all goes well with you, because I've interpreted the dream here. When all goes well, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this place. So he has been there a long time waiting, waiting, waiting. Probably roughly, I don't know, it could be 10 years. Right? And right now he's got these two guys' dreams taking this long. He actually now serves them through the dream. There's humility. Is he serving the dream? He's serving. He's there. It's not about my vision, my dream. It's actually about me serving his dream. And so here he, he comes in and he, he tells them, he says, please remember me. Just mention me to Pharaoh. I'm still here. I think I've been forgotten. How many prayers have we prayed? <laughs> like that. Lord, I'm still here. I prayed this when we planted church, I think 10, 10 years in. I remember crying out to God saying, I'm still here. <laughs> God, do you see me? Why aren't you answering our prayers? Yeah. I'll sacrifice. So he says, remember me. And then he goes and, and the one ends up dying and the other one lives just as Joseph talks about. And he's waiting. Can you imagine being in the prison waiting, thinking, right, they're going to come call for me any time now. They're going to come and get me because obviously he's, this guy lived and he's going he's to shout out for me and say, Joseph, he's, in, he's the one that translated, the, the, interpreted the, the dream. And it says here, verse 23, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. <laughs> He forgot him. In fact, he forgot him for two whole years. Until one day, after two years, he suddenly remembers him. Now, do you think this was God or do you think it was the guy? This would test your faith. Ten years away, now's the opportunity. I feel things are moving. Like we've come through a long way, God, we're ready to go. And on this, see, he could be so cynical that he could have not interpreted the dreams. But instead, he chose to put his faith and trust. And he interprets them only to ha have a blow by he got forgotten for another two years. And yet still, he used the time to make himself better, not bitter. What will you do? What will you do in this time of testing through the trust? And I want to share a, a story, and it will be very quick now, but I, I just want to give honor to this story because it's a real story. I can talk about Joseph, and as I was preparing the waiting room, this last year in particular, there has been someone in our church in Freedom who has been waiting for the whole year, and it's been... Uh, a life or death situation. I can talk about Joseph, but I want to talk to you about someone called Heather Trotman. And, <laughs> and guys, around the world right now, and may, you might not know who Heather Trotman is, but Heather and Tony, Tony, her husband, Heather and Tony Trotman, we got a picture up here of them. They, they came into our church, I think, nearly 18 years ago. 18 years being our church. That in itself, I want to honor this couple for coming in with their, their boys and being part of our church. And obviously, they have been a part of so much of the change and the growth and everything that's happened. But 25 years ago, I didn't realize this at the time, but 
Heather had a, a, a condition, ended up having a condition about 25 years ago that basically attacked her liver. And I know that definitely in the past years, I've just seen the deterioration, the pain, the suffering. There's been one thing after another, after another. I can't give justice to this in a few minutes. But I, I want to share this story because this, this is one of our families. This is one of our couples. This is one of the women, right, who I, <laughs> I think is one of the bravest women I know. And, and here she is. She's, uh, she's got this, and, and it's degenerating. So she's getting sicker and sicker and sicker. It's about 12, I think it was 12 months ago, they put her on the uh, transplant list for a new organ. And for 12 months, been waiting, waiting, waiting. Now, when you're in this position and your whole body is failing, and the sort of the, the other organs, they almost turn on the body itself. You cannot understand what it, it is like a living hell. What's going on? And here is Heather and Tony. It's happening to Heather. They're in the testing room of waiting. Waiting. God, are you going to come through? God, are you going to come through? Just in this last year, Heather spent about three months hospitalized just with different sort of stuff that's been going on. In and out of hospital, in and out. And then just a few months ago, they had a call. They had that call that we've all been praying into as a church. God provide that gift. They had a call a few months ago. And we had, yeah, on the way to the hospital, getting ready for surgery. Only then to be told, this isn't going to fit for you. Can you imagine turning up, getting ready, thinking, do you know what? I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. God has provided this. Only to get to the point <laughs> of them being told, actually, we've got it, but it's just too big. It won't fit. It's not going to be one that's going to work. When you don't know when the next one is coming and time now is getting closer and closer to a miracle being needed, it was on the September the 14th, just two weeks ago, just over two weeks ago, that Heather and Tony got a call saying, we've got another one. <laughs> they rushed into hospital, and she has had that transplant. Guys, i, I got to say to you right now, I, I am just amazed, because through the journey, and it's the journey, I've seen, you know, after church on Sundays, even through covid this woman, right, who is prone to infection and everything, has been in God's house. Every chance that she's had, she's been in worship. Every chance that she's had, she hasn't been in the waiting room thinking, oh, I've just given up. I don't want people to see me like this. She's there saying, I want to be in God's house. You know, it's like, Tony, you're going to, like, wheel me there. You're going to take, and I'm sure, Miss, really? really? And she's like, yeah, we're going to God's house. And I've seen this over this past year unfold without any guarantee that it's going to work out. And I'm saying, right up to this operation two weeks ago, I know it, it, that it was hit or miss. It's like, there isn't much more time left. God, will you come through? We have prayers at church together. And thank you, everyone, for your prayers on behalf of Heather and Tony. Thank you, church. This, I'll tell you what, if, if ever if ever I was uh, going to face or go through these things, I want to be in church like this. I want to be in a church amongst you lot that's going to pray and fast and warfare. I want to be in a church like this. Don't you walk away. Get rooted in. Get stuck in. There's something powerful about being there through the storm of the test, guys. So I asked... I asked Heather just over the weekend, I just said, Heather, what, you know, just, just tell me, what was the number one thing that kept you going? Because th this is the test of your faith, the test in the waiting room, to see her come through with a big smile, giving thanks. Yes. Check it. She was asking, just after the operation, she was asking if I was all right. <laughs> What's wrong with you, woman? <laughs> but this, th these are some of the words that she used when she replied to me. She said... I knew going through all of this that overall I was God's daughter. I trusted he had purpose over my life and that he'd be there for me no matter what. I knew this and I believed it. I trusted that God's timing was perfect and I refused to accept any other solution. His timing is perfect. 
This was confirmed that when the surgeon operated, he opened me up, he had discovered I had an infection in my tummy that within days would have killed me if I hadn't have had that transplant. I believe God uses all this pain and discomfort that I've been through. We declared his promises over our life and we stood on his word with wholehearted faith and believed that he would come through. And do you know what? He did. That is the testing room. And right now, even today, Heather's only had this operation. She's in the room. She's in the room right now. She's come to church. She's over there. She said, I can't wait for worship, she said today. I can't wait for worship. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. So as I finish up right now, as I finish up, I want to share that story. And I, I know I haven't done it enough justice. Maybe in the future, we're going to hear from her directly. But I just think it so relates to what I'm talking about. Yeah. Through the trust, through the faith, doing this. The, the last one, as we finish up right now. And I think it's all connected with everything I've shared with you. The waiting room grows your intimacy with God. You ask Heather... She had a choice whether to sort of almost turn her back on God and be angry with him or draw closer in proximity to him. And I think if you were to ask her, hey, how through that terrible time that you've experienced and she's still in recovery, how's your intimacy? I think she'd say, do you know what? It's more than ever before. The testing room of waiting will grow intimacy if you let it see when you're deprived of certain things like answers and solutions and needs it's amazing how it's an opportunity to focus on the carnal the flesh in your life or what you want or to focus on his presence the waiting room has a great habit of doing that it reveals what you truly hunger for and what you really thirst for in the waiting room Do you thirst for control or do you thirst for his lordship over your life? David said, as the deer pants after the water, so my soul thirsts for you, the living God. That's what happens. But you've got a choice. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. You'll say, no, here's the test. Here's the test. John 15, verse 5. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him, what bears much fruit? See what we're talking about? For apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you know all of this, all of the testimony we're waiting is about proximity. You either walk away and exit the waiting room or you draw closer to him and say, come on, you're with me. You are faithful. We're going to pray in the minute, but I think this is one of the biggest things that we need to grab hold of. If you don't, don't remember anything else, do you know what? In the testing room of waiting, he wants you to draw close to him. It's all about proximity, not about trying this door, trying that door. I've got to escape. Sometimes it's actually saying, I've got to get time with you. What are you doing in me? What about your presence? And there's something very profound about the way God made every one of you. Hear this. We, we, we are going to close, but just grab hold of this attention right now. Many of us are caught up with doing, right? Even for God. And we know that we, we're part of a kingdom. And we know that we take this gospel around the world. We make disciples. It's part of who we are as the church. But that's almost secondary. The very first thing that we need to realize, God didn't make you to go and do anything. He didn't come and make you so that you'd be performing. He didn't make you so that, I don't know, right, we're going to make a load of disciples and we're going to see this great big, like, everyone believe in me and you're part of the minions that are going to do it. Right? He didn't do that. Do you know what? He said, he made you so that he could have intimacy with you. He made you for intimacy first.
He made you for intimacy. This powerful thing, think in the garden, he made for fellowship, to walk together, to be together. What we do comes out of intimacy. (laughs) Because it says, if you love me, you will do these things. Not do these things and you'll find me. Know you come and know what it is to be under my wings. To know what it is to run to me. That I will not leave you or forsake you. Know what it is that I gave my son for you. Know what it is to believe in you. That everything about the testing room series is that God wants to see your potential released. He wants to see you succeed, not fail. And the foundation, the foundation of the testing room of waiting is intimacy. That's what I found. That's why we're called human beings, not human doings. Get caught up in it. But do you know what, when intimacy happens? Intimacy produces children. That's why we're a kingdom that knows no end. That's why you're part of a kingdom that advances because through intimacy, children are born daily to this kingdom. That's our commission because the one we love. And so right now as we finish, There are words suspended over your lives. There is calling unfulfilled. Promises yet to be recovered. But God says they're there. They're just suspended. Are you ready? Are you ready in the waiting room? Ready to come through? Ready to put your trust in me again? Ready to find new strength? I'm going to pray for us right now. But I want to declare this scripture over you. Isaiah 40, 31, it says, Yet those who wait, oh yeah, those who wait for the Lord. (laughs) You're going to wait, people of God. You're going to wait for him. You're feeling weak right now. Maybe you've been in the waiting room a long time and there's tiredness and fatigue. Maybe it's like, is it going to come through? Right now, there's a supernatural blessing for you. Here it is. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. All because of proximity. Father, move. Father, move right now, even in your intimacy, through the Holy Spirit. Come in, into our hearts where there's been hopelessness. I pray hope arise right now. I pray where there's been tiredness and weariness of not seeing the breakthrough. Fresh faith and patience, I declare right now that we would grasp it right now. God's speaking to you. God's speaking to you right now. And I say, if this this is for you, you identify with this. It's like, hey, it's been a long time in the waiting room, but today I want new faith. I'm going to choose hope. I'm going to choose to trust, trust to another level. Will you stand where you are right now? Will you stand where you are as a declaration of defiance of saying, look, I'm stood saying, I trust you. I trust you today. Will you stand? That's right. There's more. There's more. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. There's, there's more. As you stand, you hear saying, God, I put my trust in you again. Father, for everyone that's standing in the name of Jesus, I pray for that promise that there's new strength, oh God, new hope. Oh God, that you come in and you bring this supernatural ability. Whew, he's going he's gonna to raise you up. Those wings, the eagles. Whew, in Jesus' name, I pray for a new charge of faith and hope that you're closer to those suspended words than you know fresh calling come alive right now calling over people's lives there's calling there's calling i'm speaking out calling that you ignored your calling because it was too long to wait but god says it's not over come back wait get in the waiting room wait for me get ready so right now we posture ourselves lord and i pray that you just refresh people now refresh their spirits in the mighty name of jesus encourage their hearts Oh, Lord, as we're stirred, as we hear about that story, Lord, faith that stands all the way through. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
What an incredible message today from Pastor Gary all about the waiting room, mm. how to navigate that room well. If you did respond today, we would love to know so that we can be praying for you. Please do drop us a line in the chat box, send us an email or speak to somebody in the venue that you're in. Absolutely. And thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you join us again next week where we're going to be kicking off our brand new series all about one of our church DNA, Live Full, Die Empty. Have a great week.